Hello, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on Edexcel Topic 14 Redox 2. So this video is specifically designed for those people who are studying Edexcel Chemistry. Everything in here is dedicated to, um, to this particular syllabus and is actually um, designed in line with the specification. Um, so that's ideal if you're studying it. So it means that sometimes if you look at some videos and you're thinking, is this in my specification? Do I need to know that? Or well, this video has been specifically designed for Edexcel. So everything in here uh, you will need to know. So that's great if you're studying that. And um, there is a full range of videos as well on Edexcel in year one and year two chemistry. Um, just have a look at my Allery Chemistry YouTube channel. Um, there was loads on there. It's all for free. All I ask is that you just hit the subscribe button to show your support and I will keep uh, making the videos as long as people want to watch them basically so um, so yeah so go and have a uh, go and have a look on there there's the full range and um, if you would like to have access to this uh, this set of slides here so you can print them off you can use them on the um, you know on your way to school on the move you can use it on your smartphone or your tablet or anything like that um, then um, you can purchase them from a test shop they're really good value for money uh, click on the link in the description box and you'll be able to get a hold of them there um, also, just on my YouTube channel as well, because this is just going to look at the uh, summary of um, topic 14 for Edexcel. It's just important to go through exam technique as well. And so you'll find on my channel, I've done some exam paper walkthroughs where we'll go through some of the past papers uh, and uh, talk about um, exam technique and what to look out for and keywords that you need to use, because it's just as important to do that um, as well as um, go through the content. Okay, so this is quite a, a, a quite a big topic. Um, so there's a lot of stuff in here. So you can um, you know access it as and when you require. Really, that's that's the whole point of it. Um, and it is designed according to the specification, as you can see um, as you can see on your screen there. Um, these are the points that um, that we're going to cover. So as you can see, there's quite a bit there. There's 19 points that we need to cover. Okay, so we're going to look at the first one, which is how to set up an electrochemical cell. Um, so redox 2 is mainly looking at um, electrochemical cells um, and looking at some redox titrations um, later on as well and looking at some of the calculations. So most of this topic is going to be um, covering this area of chemistry. So we're going to look at how we set up an electrochemical cell. Uh, and an electrochemical cell is basically set up, as you can see on the screen there. So you've got um, your two beakers... Um, and you've got some electrodes in there. So the first thing we need to do to set up an electrochemical cell is we need to obtain the metals under investigation. We need to clean them with sandpaper or emery paper um, to ensure that the surfaces um, or any impurities are removed from the surfaces of our electrodes. So that's quite that's quite a standard standard thing. The next thing that we need to do. So by the way, our electrodes are these things here. So these are our metal electrodes. So the next things we need to do is we need to use um, um, some metals have grease on the surface for example when you're touching it with your hand you have oils naturally on your skin so when you touch um, these metals some of the oils can be transferred onto the metal so what we need to do is wash the surface of the metal with propanone um, and wear gloves as well moving forward to make sure that you're not contaminating the surface of the metal then what we need to do is place each metal into the solution containing the iron of the same metal so, for example, a copper electrode will be dipped into a solution of copper sulfate solution because that will produce the copper ions that, that's required. And so if we're using an oxidizing agent um, containing oxygen, you'll need to add an acid to, for example, manganate. So manganate is an oxidizing agent, so MnO4-, minus. so that needs to be acidified. So it needs to be acidified, uh, normally of acidified potassium permanganate, for example. And the fourth step is we need to make the salt bridge. And we make that from filter paper. It's a bit strange because all you do is you take some, um, it's a very simple thing, you take some um, round filter paper, you fold it up until you form um, a strip of paper, and then you soak that into a saturated solution, normally of um, potassium nitrate, but you can use potassium chloride as well. Um, and then what you do is you dip that into, you straddle that across the two beakers, but you've got to make sure that the salt bridge is in the beaker, so it's in the solution, as you can see here, there's the solution, um, but it's not touching the electrodes, it must be separate, but it must be actually in the solutions there. And then step five, we then connect the electrodes with wires, crocodile clips and a voltmeter, um, and this will show a reading if it's actually set up correctly, so your voltmeter is, remember, measuring volts, 
um, and <clears throat> well, the units is volts. Um, for those who study physics, you'll probably know this, and um, we should know it, in fact, um, it's potential difference. So we're measuring the potential difference uh, across these two electrodes. Okay, so electrons are transferred when reduction and oxidation occurs, because we're looking at redox reactions here, um, and electrochemical cells, um, effectively in, ele in an electrochemical cell, we have redox reactions. So this is why we're going to be talking about um, reduction and oxidation, because it's a redox topic, of course. So electrons are transferred, <coughs> excuse me, electrons are transferred when reduction and oxidation occurs. So we use that uh, acronym oil rig remember um, so oil rig stands for oxidation is the loss of electrons and reduction is the gain of electrons now you will have seen this or you should have seen this um, at GCSE um, and certainly um, you know you still need to remember this for uh, for a level but the acronym is just a way of remembering what that is so oxidation is loss of electrons reduction is gain so let's have an, an example here so we've got the reaction and um, so this reaction um, when calcium is completely burned in oxygen involves reduction and oxidation. So we call this a redox reaction. So no, it's not like the shower gel, uh, so don't get it confused. Uh, but it's, um, hence, re is reduction and dox, uh, sorry, red is reduction and ox is obviously oxidation. So there's our reaction there. Now what we could do is we could split that up into an oxidation reaction and a reduction reaction. So here we can see the first thing is calcium. So calcium, um, the, the reaction with calcium is being oxidized as it's losing electrons, okay? So we're going from Ca to Ca2+. Now you could do it in oxidation states as well, which you will have seen. So the oxidation state of calcium is zero. The oxidation state of calcium 2 plus is plus two. And obviously it's producing electrons, so it is being oxidized. So if that number, sorry, just to go back to that, um, if that number is going from zero to plus two, that number is increasing, that means it's been oxidized effectively. Okay. So um, in this reaction here, this one's shown reduction because it's gaining electrons. So oxygen in this case here is gaining two electrons to form O2 minus. And it's these calcium two plus and O2 minus that form the ionic compound, which is calcium oxide, which is at the top there. So you've got to be careful here um, because you are going to see obviously oxidation and reduction used as terms but there's a big difference between oxidation and reduction and oxidizing agents and reducing agents so just be really really careful with this so reducing agents they lose electrons and are oxidized themselves so i kind of remember it as just the opposite of reduction so reduction is the gain of electrons okay so a reducing agent will actually lose electrons okay because itself has been oxidized so here the reducing agent is calcium okay so calcium is our reducing agent here and an oxidizing agent is just the opposite so they gain electrons and are reduced themselves so for example you've got oxygen here at the bottom and um, so this is gaining electrons two electrons but itself has been reduced because it's gone from zero to minus two there okay so let's look at half cells so we looked at how we can make an electrochemical cell right at the start there. Um, and the electrochemical cell is made up, you can see there was two beakers there. And um, then one beaker with a metal in is called a half cell. So we're going to look at the half cell side here. So a half cell is just one half of an electrochemical cell, like I say. And they can be constructed from metal ions um, dipped in its ions, so metal that's dipped into its own ions. Um, or we can use, and you'll see here, a platinum electrode um, if we have two aqueous ions involved. So let's have a look. So here we've got a half cell. And if we had an iron electrode dipped into a solution of iron, iron 2 plus, then the reaction um, will take place in this. Now that might seem a bit strange because all we're doing is taking a bit of metal and putting it into a solution of its ions. But there is actually a reaction that happens there. Um, and the reaction here is Fe2 plus picking up two electrons to form iron in this case okay um, it's a reversible reaction so it can be reversed and that's gonna be quite important when we look at um, when we look at batteries later on re rechargeable batteries um, but you can see here in this example we've got a metal electrode which is iron and um, we've got a solution of its ions which can either be Fe2 plus or Fe3 plus and a half cell is as simple as that now, of course sometimes we have um, we have a situation where we don't have a metal electrode and we have two ions. For example, we might have Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus in this example, where we've got a, a beaker and both of our 
components. We always have two components at least. Uh, both of our components are um, are aqueous. They're, they're, there's no metal uh, version. So Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus only exist in solution. So we need to have an electrode though. And so the electrode we use here as an alternative um, is a platinum electrode. So platinum um, is used because it's inert. So in other words, it doesn't react, it doesn't interfere with the chemicals in here, which is which is quite important. But also it's a good conductor of electricity. What we want is we want electricity to travel up this electrode here into the voltmeter and then down into the into the next beaker, depending on obviously what you're connecting with. So we can use platinum as well as a, as an alternative. So an electrochemical cell, so a full cell, is basically created by joining these two half cells together. And we'd obviously we'd seen that um, in the in the first slide there, uh, looking at um, uh, looking at how we create an electrochemical cell. Okay, so like I say, electrochemical cells are made up of two half cells joined by a wire, a voltmeter, and a salt bridge. So we've already looked at how we actually make these half cells. So what we're going to do here is look at the, the mechanics of it. So when we connect two half cells together, we get one side undergoing a reduction process and the other is undergoing an oxidation process. And essentially we have a redox reaction, like I said before. So we have a redox reaction um, occurring in these, in these ones here. So here we have a voltmeter and this is to measure the voltage really it should be potential difference before physicists start to scream at us and so it's the potential difference between the two half cells and this is called the emf or the e cell um of our um the cell so the emf of the cell electrons will always flow from a more reactive metal to a less reactive one and we'll look at reactivity of metals um, later um so here we've got the zinc half cell this is it here okay showing the loss of electrons as zinc loses electrons easier than copper and so here what's actually happened is oxidation has occurred okay so zinc is forming zinc 2 plus plus two electrons so what we will see is because zinc is forming zinc 2 plus which is in solution obviously the electrons and um, then we see the zinc electrode becoming thinner it's getting worn away um, so this is starting to degrade and the electrons start moving around that wire. So there we are. Okay, so you can see, so the electrons um, uh, move through the wire and move towards the copper electrode. So at copper, what we've got here is uh, we have a reduction process happening. So the copper 2 plus picks up the two electrons that have come from the zinc um, and that forms copper. So what we see here, the observation, is we see a buildup of copper um, along the bottom of the electrode here. So we start to get a buildup of copper here. Um, that's quite important um, because we need to know when we set up this reaction, what we want to observe is we need to know which one is actually giving up the electrons and which one is donating. So when we set this up, we can see that because we can just look at the state of the uh, of the electrodes um, if they are set up in this way. For example, a metal dipped into its metal ions. So we can see the, um, the process is actually happening. So observations are just as important, obviously. Okay, and obviously we've got our salt bridge as well, which is um, made from potassium nitrate solution, like we say. So the salt bridge, its purpose really is there, so the ions can flow through. So you've got to have, the reason why we use the salt is because we've got free moving ions within it. Um, and all the salt bridge does, it helps to balance out the charges in the um, in the um in the cell that's quite important because if we if you didn't have it you can try it but if we didn't have the salt bridge in there it wouldn't work it simply wouldn't so it completes that circuit so um, you don't need to worry too much about the salt bridge other than that's what it's um, that's what its function is okay so each half cell has an electrode potential it has an e naught value um, and that's measured in volts um, and it tells us e how easily the half cell gives up electrons or in other words how easily it is oxidized so you will have noticed like from the previous slide that the two half cells each have a reversible reaction okay so we've got a zinc half cell and we've got a copper half cell so you've seen that you've seen that previously already so in electrochemical cells we always write the equations in the reduced form so this means we always show electrons um uh, we always we always show electrons on the left hand side of our equation um, and <clears throat> this means 
um, it's always reduction in the in the forwards direction. So, for example, here you can see here that zinc is gaining two electrons, copper is going two electrons, gaining two electrons. So you'll see there is a, an electrochemical series, and we'll, we'll look at some of the some of that later on. But um, the electrochemical series is basically a list of different types of half cells, but they're all written in a standard form, and that is in the reduced form, as you can see on there. So remember when we connect two half cells together we always have one half cell undergoing reduction and one undergoing oxidation and to work out which one's been reduced and which one is oxidized we need to look at their electrode potential value um, and now you're not expected to remember the electrode potential values they will be given to you in the exam um, so they'll either be given to you on a, on a data sheet but normally it's just given to you within the question so look out for it and um, but we'll look at how we can use Electrode, uh, the electrochemical series and these electrode potentials to work out which one's been reduced and which one's been oxidized. So you can see here <clears throat> that I've put the figures in here. So we've got zinc has an E0 value of minus 0 0.76 and copper has an E0 value of plus 0 0.34. And here we could see that the zinc half cell has a negative value and the copper one has a positive value. So this is going to have... Um, the, the actual state of it, so whether it's negative or positive or more positive or more negative, is very important in helping us decide if that is undergoing oxidation or reduction. Now, it's obviously dependent upon what it's connected to. So we use this acronym to help us. So um, you might have a different one. You might have a different way of working it out. There's, there's numerous ways. I, um, I like to use this one. Anything where there's an acronym, I think it helps you to remember because these can be very, very complicated. There's a lot of oxidation and reduction and electrons moving from one side to the other. This can be a very uh, bit of a minefield, this topic. So I think um, getting clarity on certain areas can really focus your mind and make sure that you can um, answer the questions correctly and you're not getting a bit muddled and mixed up. So I use this acronym anyway, and I use the acronym NO PROBLEM. Okay, so the most negative half cell will undergo oxidation, so that's NO, and then the most positive half cell will undergo reduction, so PROBLEM. Okay, so if we take the um, the first four letters there, um, we can uh, we can see NO PROBLEM. So when you see anything to do with half cells, just think, yeah, NO PROBLEM. Okay, and then you'll uh, and then you'll remember it. So it's a good way of remembering what's been oxidized, uh, what's been oxidized, and what's been reduced. So in this case, we can see that zinc is the most negative, um, and so will be the half cell where oxidation takes place. Okay, so oxidation is the loss of electrons. So what we do is we flip the equation. So anywhere where we've got an oxidation process happening, and obviously it depends on what it's bonded to, depends what you're connecting your half cell to. So in this case, zinc is. Um, uh, zinc is the uh, is the most negative here, but you might have you might connect zinc with something that's even more negative than zinc, in which case that's going to be the most negative. So in this setup here, zinc is the most negative. We flip the equation to show that it is actually losing equa uh, losing equations, losing electrons. Okay, so that's what we've done at the bottom there. We've now flipped it round the other way. We've got zinc forming zinc two plus plus two electrons. That is vitally important. Is flipping that equation round so you can see exactly what's going on. Okay. Then once we've done that, um, we can then combine these equations um, and, and come up with an overall equation, a redox reaction, what's happening within this cell. So we can see um, that we have zinc giving up the electrons, copper is accepting them, and we combine the two equations and we get that overall equation, which is the one at the bottom there, right, right at the bottom there. So you can see when you see this, think no problem, okay? And you'll see I'll use this, um, I'll use this um, system, this acronym, um, um, all the way through for future examples, and you'll see how helpful. I hope it is anyway. Uh, how helpful it could be to remember that. Okay, so let's look at the she, okay? So this is called a standard hydrogen electrode. And so the standard hydrogen electrode is used as a reference to measure standard electrode potentials, which is E0. This is important because you might think, where on earth do we get their numbers from? How do you know that that half cell is minus 0.75? Okay. Well, we know that because it's been measured against a, a reference, a zero. Okay. So it's a bit like, um, <clears throat> it's a bit like saying, uh, having um, scales, for example, you always have to pre you always have to set it to zero because we have to measure it against something. Now, I could say, let's say, um, if I say, um, is an elephant heavy? Okay, you might say, well, yes, 
and the reason why you're answering that is because you're making reference to something else. But if I then add to that, um, is an elephant um, is an elephant heavy in comparison to the Earth? You'll say, well, no, it's really light. So what we're doing is we are measuring it against something. We're making an assessment because in our minds we're we're measuring probably an elephant against everyday objects like cars. Um, ourselves and um, you know items that we carry and we think yeah an elephant is heavy so this is what we do but in chemistry we've got to measure it against something and we use a standard hydrogen electrode to do that so electrode potentials of half cells like you say they can't be measured on their own we can't just put a bit of metal in in a, in a solution of its own ions and say oh well that's 0.72 uh, volts you just can't do that so we need to measure it against a standard electrode um, and that electrode we we give it a value of zero volts so it's set up like this. So we've got our standard hydrogen electrode on the left there, as you can see. So there's our platinum electrode, and we've got this glass, this glass bulb here. So what goes in on the side is hydrogen gas, and that goes in at 298 Kelvin and 100 kilopascals. So these are some of the standard conditions that's required in a standard hydrogen, a standard hydrogen electrode. Um, we have one mole per dm cubed of H plus ions in the bottom there. That's very important. Um, and on the other side, in this example, we're going to measure the E0 value of copper. It could be any electrode on that side, though. Um, but whatever the electrode is, we must have one mole of the ions in that solution there. So in this case, one mole of copper ions, copper 2 plus ions. So the word standard, like I say, is important because when we're measuring the E0 value, we've got to measure it at a standard temperature, standard conditions, etc. If it's not measured in a standard way, then it's very difficult to compare E0 values. So you need to know the standard conditions. So the standard conditions are temperature at 298 Kelvin, a pressure at 100 kilopascals, uh, and a concentration of ions uh, must be at one moles per decimeter cubed. And this means that when we're comparing E0 values of different half cells, that we're, we're actually, um, uh, we're actually um, making a fair comparison. So the diagram to the left shows the um, standard hydrogen electrode connected to the copper half cell. And assuming the conditions are met, the voltmeter will tell us the electrode potential for the copper, copper 2 plus half cell. So one thing we've got to be really careful about here, and this is very, very important, and you've got to be very vigilant um, at looking for this in the exam. But you'll notice here that we must always have, one of the standard conditions is we must have one moles per dm cubed of H plus ions in this beaker here. Now, depending on the acid, the acid that we use here will obviously depend on what ions or how much we how much we use. So, for example, if we have HCl, um, so no, let's say uh, to get one mole per dm cubed of H plus ions, we need one mole per dm cubed of HCl because that is a monoprotic acid. Um, and um, if we're using sulfuric acid to generate our H plus ions, then we only need half a mole per dm cubed because half mole dm cubed of um, sulfuric acid will produce one mole of H plus ions. So remember, it's the H plus ions that we're after, not the molarity, uh, not the concentration of the acid. So we need to know how many H plus ions will that acid produce, and that will tell us how many, well, you know, how much acid we need and what strength we need um, of that acid. Very important. Um, you know, don't don't trip up on that type of thing. Okay, so remember I was talking about the electrochemical series um, and about the comparison of them. This is where we're going to start looking at, a, um, at some of the slides will have the electrochemical series on it. So I'm just going to show you what it looks like, which is not massively exciting to be honest, it's just a list of electrochemical um, uh, values. But um, what we are going to look at is, is basically how we can use them, okay? Because this is very common um, in, in the exam for them to, for you to use the electrochemical series. So the electrochemical series is just a list of cell reactions in their standard electrode potential. So that's your E0 value. So this is just an example of, um, of an electrochemical series. Electrochemical series is massive. Um, this is just a snippet of that. Um, so it's just a short list of some examples here. There is nowhere near enough space to put everything on there. So note, this table shows the E0 value in descending order. So you can see they're going from the biggest number down to the smallest number at the bottom. It can go the other way around. There's no set, um, there's no set rule with that. Now, you'll notice as well that actually just before we go into different, the different types of agents, you'll notice here, these, they're all written in the reduced form. This is standard. Okay, so this, this, 
this won't change you always have electrons written on the left hand side remember um, you may have to flip one of the equations around and um, if it's been oxidized so uh, but we'll look at that we'll look at that later this is where the no problem bit comes into it but this is the electrochemical series so remember we're looking at the oxidizing agents and reducing agents so you can see here we've got stronger oxidizing agent as we go up this table here we've got a stronger oxidizing agent so agents on the left hand side of the equation are much more easily reduced okay because the e naught value basically is telling us that this is very likely to happen okay so it's a plus one three six that means this is telling us that this reaction going forward is very likely to happen so in other words chlorine accepting two electrons to form two cl minus is a very favorable reaction so they have an increase in tendency to gain the electrons. So that means these are more powerful oxidizing agents. Okay. So the most powerful oxidizing, ag oxidizing agent here is chlorine um, because it's on the left-hand side. And the weakest oxidizing agent is the one right at the bottom here, which is Mg2+. So this has got a negative value. This is telling us that this forward reaction is just not likely to go. If it's got a negative value, it's telling you, look, it's, magnesium is not massively keen to accept these two electrons. So it is the weakest oxidizing agent. And we could go the other way as well. So we can look at reducing agents. Um, so you can see here that agents on the right-hand side of the equation are more easily oxidized. So they have an increasing tendency to lose electrons instead. So they're more powerful reducing agents. So you can see the most powerful reducing, reducing agent here is magnesium. So it's got to be on the right-hand side of the equation. You can see here there's your magnesium. Um, and your weakest reducing agent is Cl-. So you've got to be able to look at an electrochemical series like this. Look at the value. Make sure it's going the right way. Okay, but basically um, the most powerful reducing agent is the agent that is the most negative and on the right hand side and the most powerful oxidizing agent is the most positive and on the left hand side. So you are expected to be able to identify reducing powerful reducing agents or most powerful reducing agents and most powerful oxidizing agents using electrochemical series. So make sure you're familiar with that. Okay, so Standard hydrogen, uh, sorry, standard electrode potential, so E naught. These can be used to calculate the standard cell potential, which is E naught of the cell. Okay, so let's have a look. This is pretty straightforward. This stuff, but uh, E naught of the cell is E naught of the reduced minus E naught of the oxidized. Okay, so remember, remember how we identified if a reaction was reduced or oxidized. Remember, no problem. Okay, so this is where it comes back in. So if you know that acronym, it all fits into place. So it all it all kind of uh, slots into place, in particular with this type of reaction. So, and you remember how you might think, well, how do you remember it's reduced minus oxidized? Well, just remember it's redox. Okay, so it's in the same order. So it's redox. Yeah, reduced minus oxidized. So you know that reduction comes first. So remember the half cell equation with the most e negative e naught value is being oxidized. This is no problem. Yeah, negative oxidized, uh, positive reduced. Okay, no problem. So um, if you have two positives or two negatives, it is the most negative that is oxidized. Okay, so let's have a look. So you're going to use this data here. So we've brought back our electrochemical series here. Um, so we're going to use the data in the electrochemical series to calculate the E naught of the cell when Cl2, Cl, Cl minus um, half cell and the zinc 2 plus and zinc half cell are connected. So let's have a look. So the first thing we need to do is we need to identify which is being oxidized. So the zinc 2 plus and zinc half cell is the most negative. So this is oxidized. Okay. So then we need to calculate the E naught of the cell. So we've got 1.36, which is this value here. This is your um, Cl, Cl minus electrode potential. And then you've got minus, minus 0.76 which is the zinc half cell here, okay? And that gives us an E naught value of 2.12 volts. Let's look at a second example. So we're gonna use the data in the um, electrochemical series to calculate the E naught of the cell when the Cl2, Cl minus half cell and the Cu2 plus Cu half cells are connected. So we kept the chlorine half cell there, but we've changed the copper half cell, okay? So let's have a look. So we need to identify which is being oxidized. So the Cu2 plus Cu half cell is the most negative. So this one is actually oxidized. 
and so therefore we calculate the e naught of the cell and we get plus 1.02 so really here what we're looking at is you've got copper which is plus 0.34 and chlorine is plus 1.36 so both are positive but the uh, copper is the most negative so we treat that um, as the um, treat that as the, as the negative one so don't worry it doesn't have to be actually negative or actually positive it's just which one is more positive or more negative okay so what affects standard electrode uh, standard cell potential so electrode potentials can change if the conditions deviate away from them standard conditions so remember them standard conditions are one mole per dm cubed of solution 298 kelvin and 100 kilopascals of pressure okay so if if we deviate away from any of them and um, we start and get um, changes in our electrode potentials so if we've seen the electrode potentials involve reversible reactions okay so they've got that reversible arrow in there and like other reversible reactions the equilibrium position changes depending on the reaction conditions so for example um, a half cell is affected by changes in temperature concentration or pressure so if we change the equilibrium position, the cell potential value changes as well. So this is why we use standard conditions to measure the electrode potentials. And by doing this, we ensure that we get the same values and it allows us um, to make comparisons between um, different half cells. So it is vitally important that the conditions are met. Okay, so we're going to look at cell notation now. So cell notation is a way of, so you've seen the beakers there. You've seen the beakers with the, um, uh, with the um, electrodes in there and your solutions, etc. But um, this is science, this is chemistry. So we're always looking for a way to simplify things. And the cell notation is a way of drawing down your cell without actually drawing a beaker and a salt bridge and all that. Um, so it's a much neater way of doing it. So cell notation, like I said, they simplify how we draw a cell. So, they're written in a standard way. So, um, they're represented with the most negative half cell potential goes to the left of a double line. So, the double line you can see is in, um, in our cell notation. There's our double line. So, anything to the left, which is to this side here, um, is the most negative half cell. Anything to the right is obviously the most positive. So, you can see here that we've got single lines single solid lines these show a physical state change so what you'll see in your half cell we'll look at an example as well later on but um you see you have a single line here this might be for example between copper and um, copper ions in solution so you'll have copper and copper ions so um there's a there's a physical change between solution and the metal ion so therefore we put a single line in there solid line to show a state change the double line represents the salt bridge so that's between the two beakers and so let's have a look so we looked at this example already with copper and zinc so you can see here that we use to to represent that um cell and um, that cell that uh, that cell setup your electrochemical cell and um, then we use the um cell notation as we've seen there so we've got zinc two plus and zinc so we always have two parts to this, remember. So your most oxidized form in this case is zinc 2 plus. This is the one closest to the salt bridge. The one outside of this single line is the reduced form. So that's zinc, that's zinc solid. So you can see here, we've done exactly the same with copper as well. But because zinc is, um, zinc is the most negative half cell, this one goes to the left hand side of the double line and copper is the most positive half cell. So this goes to the right hand side of the double line. Okay, so there we are. So the reason why we know that zinc 2 plus is, in, is the most oxidized form, <coughs> excuse me, is because um, if we look at zinc, it has an oxidation state of zero. Zinc 2 plus has an oxidation state of 2 plus. Um, so therefore, it is the most oxidized because it's the biggest oxidation number. Okay, but what if you have two aqueous ions? Okay, so we've seen an example where we had Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus and we used a platinum electrode. Well, that's fairly straightforward. All we do is we use a comma instead to separate Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus. We don't use a solid line because obviously they're in the same state. So we use common, uh, commas to, um, to um, separate substances in the same state. So here's an example here. Here's the Fe2 and Fe3 plus example. So here we've got magnesium mg and mg2 plus standard but here you can see we've got fe3 and fe2 plus we put a comma between them because these are in the same state 
So we'll put a comma there. Uh, we've got a physical line there because we do have a, a state change between our iron solution and, um, our, and uh, our platinum electrode as well. So we do have a solid line um, within that. Okay, so obviously remember to use your platinum electrode. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of, um, well, a little bit of uh, pre uh, predictions here, some some predictive um, uh, predictive techniques. So this is unfortunately not going to tell you how to, uh, or what the lottery numbers are, because if they are, then I would use this method to work that out. But it will tell us if a reaction is going to be feasible. So it's, 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 yeah, it's not the same, is it? But anyway, standard electrode potential, so your E0 values that we've seen, they can be used to predict if a stated reaction is likely to proceed under standard conditions. So this is quite clever, this. So let's have a look. So example one, we're going to use the data in the electrochemical series to predict whether solid magnesium will react with the copper two plus ions in solution under standard conditions. So you can see here, we've got our electro electrochemical series there on the left. So the first thing what we need to do is we need to identify which has been oxidized. I and mean, in this case, the um, the Mg2 plus Mg half equation has the most negative E0 value. So remember, no problem. Negative is oxidation um, and uh, positive is reduction. Okay, so you've got to remember that. So now we've identified that, we then take that oxidized form and we flip it round, reverse it, and we write the two equations next to each other um, side by side like this. So we've got our um, equation here. This is our oxidized one. Um, so we flip that the other way around and our copper one remains the same. Okay, so we write them side by side like that. And then what we do is we combine them in two equations and the equation that we actually write as a result of this method is the feasible reaction. Okay, so this is the one that's actually going to work. Now, what we do is we compare that equation to the reaction stated in the question. So we can see that magnesium will react with copper two plus ions. So, um, so there's a match. So actually the answer is, um, yes, this will actually, uh, this will actually work. It's feasible. And we can always confirm this and it's always, if you've seen any of my other videos, you'll know that I always like to confirm it. I always like to come up with techniques in which you can check, for example, Hess's cycle at the start of add up to zero. Same with the born haber cycle, etc. So there's always little methods in which you can check. Because I find, I think, if you have that confidence when you're in an exam, just do a quick check. And if it's right, it gives you a bit of a boost and sets you up well for the rest of the paper, doesn't it? So, so this is a way in which you can test it. So very simple. Put it into that E0 cell calculation that equation that we'd seen all feasible reactions will always have a positive e naught cell value okay so here it is here e naught cell my, uh, 0 0.34 and um, because this is the value that we've got here for copper minus minus 2.38 remember it's reduced minus oxidized so oxidized is 2.38 that's our magnesium and that gives us 2.72 volts that is a positive value so that means it is feasible so it's as simple as that. So remember that equation there. There's the equation at the top there. Okay. Okay. So let's look at a second example. So we're going to look at a justify example. So we're using different keywords here, just like the examiners may do. So we use the data in the electrochemical series to justify why iron nails become rusty when in contact with air and moisture. So we've been told that actually, yes, this reaction does work. It is feasible because we see it obviously in everyday life, but we need to justify that. We need to prove that. We need to back it up with evidence, back it up with data. Okay, so let's have a look. So we need to identify which has been oxidized. Um, there we are. Okay, so we need to identify which has been oxidized. Um, in this case, it's Fe2 plus half equation has the most negative E0 value, so it's oxidized. Now, what I've done as well, um, it's actually jumped ahead a little bit, um, is that we've got two of the um, equations that are circled. So obviously the iron one is circled here at the bottom. This is the iron one here. This has been circled because we're using an iron nail. Um, this one has been circled because it contains oxygen. And remember things go rusty and told us in here um, that things go rusty because of the oxygen in the air. Okay, so we must find an equation that shows um, oxygen in it. So in this case, this is the equation we're going to be using. Okay, so this is why we're picking these two. Um, and obviously the one with the most negative E0 value is the one that's been oxidized. In this case, it's iron, which is the negative minus 0.44. So have a think about what you do with that now. 
Well, we reverse it. We flip it, of course, just like what we've done before. So we reverse that equation. We flip it around the other way, write the two equations side by side um, like this. Um, so we've got our iron, which has been oxidized, and obviously our oxygen one, which has been reduced. And here, now this is where, if you do maths, you would have done simultaneous equations. Um, so this is the same method, but you can see here that we have an imbalance in electrons. So in chemistry, we're looking for an equal number of electrons. So we've got two electrons in the top. Um, and we've got four electrons in the bottom one there. So what we need to do is multiply that top equation by two to make sure that we've got the number of electrons the same and then we can cancel it out. So when we combine these two equations, um, we get this reaction here. And so this equation, remember, is the feasible reaction. This is the reaction that will work. So we compare this uh, equation to the reaction stated in the question and we can then justify then that we say that iron will react with oxygen and water so therefore they match so you must have water and oxygen in the air which of course it is in the air it's readily available in the air and iron and then that will work that is a feasible reaction so you can see we can again confirm this putting it into your e naught um equation remember if it comes out as a positive value then it means it is feasible and in this case it comes up with a positive 0.84 volts so therefore it is a positive reaction it is feasible okay so we can use um we can use the same method to predict if a disproportionation reaction is likely to proceed too so just remember a disproportionation reaction is a reaction where we have oxidation and reduction occurring simultaneously on the same element so let's have a look at an example this is example three now okay so we're going to use the following data now we've got silver uh, plus go into silver metal and we've got silver two plus go into silver plus so we've got different forms of silver here and we've got the e naught values next to them both are positive and what we're going to do is we're going to predict whether an AG plus will disproportionate in solution okay so let's have a look so the first thing we need again exactly the same we need to identify which is being oxidized so the ag plus ag half equation has the most negative e naught value yes it's positive but it's the most negative out of the two so that one is oxidized and so then we take that oxidized equation and we reverse it just like before no difference write the two equations side by side next to each other you can see on there you can see the electrons in this example actually balance out. We've got one electron at the top and one electron in the bottom. So then we combine the two equations to obtain our feasible reaction. So this is no different to what we've just done before. And then what we do is we compare the equation with the reaction stated in the question. And we can see that Ag plus will not disproportionate in solution. So the reason why is because you've got um, Ag so remember it's the ag plus that we're looking for so ag plus isn't actually disproportionating in this reaction um, at all and we can confirm this by calculating the e naught of the cell um, all feasible reactions will have a positive e naught cell value okay and of course this one's got a negative value and we know it's not disproportionating because we can see that the ag plus is not on the left hand side and not forming the reaction that that we require so it isn't actually disproportionating in this in this forward reaction here so therefore um, obviously our e naught value tells us that it's not feasible either okay so we're still on feasibility but this is a warning now and um, just because we calculate e naught to state a feasible reaction it doesn't mean it will actually go oh, so just when you thought actually we've got it cracked here and we've sorted it there's always something thrown in a spanner in the works so um this one actually has a bit of sense to it though um, and you'll it's not too difficult hopefully um non-standard conditions so if we change the concentration temperature then this can cause the electrode potential to change so remember we said that already so that's one thing so let's take that rusty nail example last time that we that was i think that was example two that we looked at we know that it has a positive e naught value okay so that means it's a feasible reaction but um the problem is that um you know a rusty nail it takes ages to actually um to work it's, it takes a long process but also um if we actually alter some of these conditions we actually alter the e naught value so for example if we increase the concentration of oxygen 
equilibrium will shift to the right, which means it's easier for O2 to gain the electrons. Okay, and so the electrode potential of the half cell will become more positive, and um, uh, and the cell potential will be higher. That should say cell, not fell potential, of course. Um, so the cell potential will be higher. And obviously, um, if we increase the concentration of iron in the equilibrium, this will shift left. So if we increase the amount of iron, which is here, then equilibrium is going to shift to this side to get rid of the iron that you've just added. So this is Le Chatelier's principle. So therefore, less electrons will be used up. Um, and so the electrode potential of the Fe2 plus Fe becomes less negative. Okay, so it's effectively we're not it's not proceeding as it should be because we're not using up as many electrons. So that figure there is not going to be as negative. Um, and so therefore the full cell potential will be lower. So you can see here, as we alter the conditions of this equilibrium, we actually get a, um, a slightly different um, value. Um, and this is what I was saying as well, just before I jumped in a little bit too soon there with kinetics. So um, obviously the iron reaction, rusty, um, a rusting reaction is a very, very slow reaction. So just because, um, um, just because it um, says it's favourable, um, it may not be if the reaction is too slow. For example, it's just that slow that we can't actually see it. Um, or the reaction might have a high activation energy as well. So um, if, the activa if the activation energy is too high, then um, the reaction won't go. So you might need to add a catalyst in there to reduce the activation energy. And that means it allows the reaction to go at the conditions that were stated. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So what we can do is we can make the links between cell potential uh, and entropy and the equilibrium constants. Okay, so we can put all this together. And we've seen bits of this already. And um, if you've watched my other videos on entropy um, and, and equilibrium as well. So we've seen little bits of this already. So the link here is the larger the cell potential, the larger the total entropy change during the cell reaction. Okay, so we've got a large electrode potential here, so a very, um, say, a very large uh, E naught value. Then that means we've got a bigger entropy change. So here we can write an equation. So E naught, which is our electrode potential value, is proportional to the entropy total. So obviously that that symbol there means um, directly proportional to, and obviously delta S total is the total entropy change that we've seen. So. Um, we know there's a link between the two, and so that's quite important because the exam board may link these two topics together. Also, as entropy and equilibrium constant are linked, we can also say that E0 is directly proportional to um, the natural log of your um, equilibrium constant, which is K. And we've seen a little bit more of this um, in topic 13, so have a look at topic 13 if you're not too sure. Okay, because we're talking about cells, we're now naturally we're going to talk about batteries. Okay, because this is where we can store energy, and batteries exist in our everyday life. It's obviously it, they're everywhere. It's powering, it's powering this tablet that I'm working from here. It's powering the microphone that I'm speaking into. Um, it's powering the screen that's allowing you to watch this um, as well. So, um, so batteries more than likely if it's on your phone or tablet. So, um, to establish the overall reaction, um. To establish the overall reaction uh, in this lithium-ion battery, we need to know the half equations at each electrode. So let's have a look at the half equations here. So the half equations in this cell are, we've got Li plus, plus an electron forms lithium. So we've got an E0 value of minus 3.04. Uh, and we've got another uh, reaction here with cobalt dioxide here, forming an E0 of uh, plus 0.56 so again you'd be given these values here so don't worry about them okay so lithium li plus or li um, has the most negative e naught value so oxidation occurs here so this means we flip that equation uh, and this shows electrons being produced i.e we've got a negative electrode so the negative electrode here is lithium forming lithium plus and an electron okay so we flip that equation we flip that equation around so the positive electrode is Li plus plus your cobalt dioxide plus your electron uh, will form um, your Li plus uh, complex here. So you can see with your cobalt uh, dioxide uh, attached to the, the lithium ion. So you've got your, not a complex, it's your ionic, your ionic compound here that's been, that's been formed. So this 
this remains uh, unchanged. So we flip the lithium and remain kept that the same. Okay, so we've got negative electrode, positive electrode. So the overall equation on discharge, so this is using the battery, um, is this. We combine the two equations, the electrons uh, balance, so we just combine the two equations there. Okay, so to work out the E0 of the cell, remember we do reduced minus oxidized. So we've got E0 of the cell is 0.56, um, which is this bit here. So that's the reduced part, remember, and the oxidized bit is this bit, so it's minus minus 3.04, um, and this is 3.6 volts. So this is no surprise, because lithium-ion batteries are in um, most um, portable devices, um, and naturally you want it to actually produce a good amount of power, don't you? Because otherwise, you know, you do all sorts of phones now and tablets. So, um, you know, so this is vitally important because we need something with a really good in cell, and thankfully it is. It's 3.6 volts um, that's produced from these uh, from these batteries here. So, um, you know, that's quite important. Now, um, this this is used, This the, the whole point of this, the reason why, if this is used is because you can recharge it you can walk around with it on a mobile um obviously in a, in a mobile way you know you can walk around with it. you don't have to have it plugged in all the time but we've got to be able to charge it back up again because eventually some of that power will run out so when we recharge it the simple thing we do is we add a current to it we plug it into a source of electrons um and that then forces the equilibrium to shift the other way so we get a reversing of this reaction so if they ask you um you know to write an equation to show the recharging of a battery all you do is you write the discharge equation back to front so you do li plus coo2 minus um will produce lithium and coo2 okay so it's as simple as that so it's not it's not too uh, not too traumatic okay so let's look at fuel cells. Um, now, electricity um, in a fuel cell is, is generated using a continuous supply of chemicals. Um, so they must have a ready store. So unlike batteries, where you can plug it in and then detach it from its supply, which is the, the power supply, and walk around with it and then plug it in later on if you need to, fuel cells need a continuous supply. You can't detach them. They've got to have a continuous supply of fuel. So let's have a look how they work. So this is going to look at an alkaline hydrogen oxygen fuel cell. Um, and there's an example of the diagram on the left there. Um, and it shows what it looks like. So what we're going to do is go through each step and then summarize at the end um, about what's happening at each, at each part. So the number one, so you can see on the, on the diagram we've labeled this as number one. Here hydrogen is fed in here. It reacts with the OH minus ions in solution. So in here, this is at number nine, we'll look at this later on. And the reaction that occurs here is the hydrogen reacts with the OH minus ions that come from here, and that forms your four lots of water and four electrons. And then the second bit, well, once them electrons have been produced, they then move up into, um, into the wire through the platinum electrode. Um, remember we use platinum because it's a good conductor and it's inert. And then the third bit is then these electrons run through the component here, um, and this can be used to power something. So that could be um, a car. Um, it could be um, a home, for example. You might have a, a, a fuel cells at the front, which can then be used to, to power a home. It depends on where you live, of course. If it's quite remote, some countries, you know, do use fuel cells to generate power, particularly if there's not a, um, a you know, a nat like a national grid uh, that, that, that exists. Okay, so number four, we get an oxygen feed. So we're now at the other side of the um, of the... Uh, fuel cell here so oxygen is fed in here reacts with the water and the four electrons made from step one um, to make OH minus ions remember this is where the OH minus ions are produced so oxygen comes in here reacts with some of the water that was produced um, and it makes the OH minus ions so here's our overall reaction here so them electrons that were made here move around um, and effectively react with the oxygen here and form your OH minus ions so then the negative electrode, which is at number five, this is your cathode, which is the, this bit here. So electrons flow to the negative electrode, and this is obviously made of platinum as well, just like our anode, which is at the other side. So number six is our electrolytes. So this is the um, solution that's in between the two electrodes, um, and this is made from potassium hydroxide solution. So it carries the OH minus ions made from the cathode to the anode. And then... Seven is the positive electrode. This is the anode. This is what I was saying. Um, so electrons flow from this, um, and this is also made of platinum, just like the uh, just like the cathode. 
Uh, number eight, water is eliminated at this step here. So the product of the reaction in step one is eliminated and is released to the surroundings. So the only um, externality with this is water. So it's much cleaner than a fossil fuel. Um, and nine is obviously the movement of your OH minus ions that were produced from step four. Um, and so this is obviously carried towards the anode via the electrolyte, which suspends it. Okay. So we see here as well, we've got to have a, a bit of a membrane between our electrolyte and our electrodes. Um, and these line the platinum electrodes and what this allows is allows our OH minus ions to pass through, but not hydrogen and oxygen gas. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is important because what we don't want is our oxygen floating through. Yeah, we don't want our oxygen to come through here and just float across here. We want to actually utilize the electrons that are generated and do something with them. So let's have a look at a summary. So remember at number one, our hydrogen feed that comes through, this reacts with OH minus ions in solution in nine. Um, and so this obviously um, forms our uh, water molecules and our four electrons. And then at the other side, so the oxygen feed here um, reacts with the water and the four electrons um, made from step one. And um, this made to OH minus ions. So there's our overall um, half equation there. Um, so remember, these can also work in acidic conditions as well. So instead of having OH minus ions that are produced, we have H plus ions that are moving across. Uh, and this moves across a polymer electrolyte uh, membrane as well. So it doesn't just have to be uh, alkaline based. It can be acid based fuel cells. And so if we combine them equations from step one and four, then we get our two half equations here, which is 2H2 plus O2 will form 2H2O gas. So fairly straightforward um, and obviously has um, you know a, a, the net effect of producing water and effectively we need a hydrogen and oxygen fuel source to produce that and we're just using electricity from it so a very clean form of energy um, you know where it's a, a very good way of of generating electricity um, and using it to, to some kind of good use okay so let's look at some other types of fuel cells as well so some fuel cells use hydrogen rich molecules such as methanol and ethanol to um you know to, to power cars in particular so the car industry has developed uh, alcohol fuel cells which create uh, hydrogen gas using a reformer and so the main alcohols are methanol and ethanol now this is um i believe this is used quite uh, quite extensively in brazil um, because of um, you know their supply, they, they can produce large amounts of methanol, and ethanol from sugar. So um, so um, a lot of the crops there are used to generate fuel um, to to fuel cars using using this method. So some newer fuels now use the fuel directly without the need to convert to hydrogen first. And so this is how it works. So we've got the alcohol is oxidized at the anode with the water present. Okay, so there's our alcohol. This is uh, alcohol. Sorry, this is methanol um, reacting with water and um, water present here. This produces carbon dioxide, six electrons and H plus. So the alcohol is effectively being oxidized here with the anode. Um, and the H plus ions that are produced, these pass through the electrolyte. They're oxidized to water um, at the other side. So we've got the H plus um, Obviously, the electrons are then being used to power something as it as it moves through. H plus six electrons, one and a half uh, oxygen, and that will produce three lots of water as well. So again, quite a, a green way of of um, you know in terms of the the direct um, the direct production of the of the fuel. Um, it's a it's a cleaner way of, of powering a car rather than using um, fossil fuels. Okay. So. We're now going to look at uh, redox, um, moving away from the cell side and the fuel cells and moving away from there. We're now going to look at redox titrations um, just for the uh, for the last section of, of this of this video. So um, titrations are vitally important and you would have seen acid base titration. So using an indicator, et cetera, et cetera. This is the same method, but we're not neutralizing an acid and a base. What we're doing is we're undergoing um, a redox reaction so there's a slight difference with these types of um, uh, titrations so like i say they can be used to work out the concentration uh, the concentration of a reducing or oxidizing agent and in this example we're going to look at finding the concentration of manganate ions mno4 minus by titrating it against a reducing agent like fe2 plus so what we're going to look at in this example is just the concentration but um, of 
uh, finding the concentration of a reducing agent, but we can reverse it to find the concentration of an oxidizing agent as well. It's not exclusively for reducing agents. So what we do is we have um, our reducing agent in here. In this case, for example, we have Fe2 plus solution. Um, we have an unknown concentration, so we don't know how much we've got in there, uh, but we know it's volume because we've added it in there, so we can measure it. Normally, the volume is probably going to be 25 centimeters cubed, something like that. Obviously, you'd use a, a, a pipette to do that with a, um, a pipette filler on the top. You might have one of them uh, ones with a little wheel on the side with the plunger that rises up as you as you fill it up, or you might have one of them rubber ones with a big rubber bulb on it, um, and that helps you to uh, with obviously your, your pipette on the end, and that allows you to fill um, or take 25 centimeters cubed uh, quite precisely. Now, remember what we need to do is we need to add dilute sulfuric acid into this as well, and this means we have sufficient H plus ions to allow um, the to allow the reduction of the oxidizing agents. Remember, with anything like uh, manganate, it's normally acidified, or dichromate is another one where you have to acidify it um, to allow this reaction to happen. So that's quite normal. So we have our oxidizing agent in our burette, and this has a known concentration, so we know the strength of it. So this could be manganate ions. So manganate. Um, seven ions in this case, um, so MnO4 minus. And so what we're going to do is we're going to add the manganate ions into the burette, into the conical flask, until we see the faint colour of manganate um, appear, so MnO4 minus, wait until that appears. And this is known as the end point. Uh, and remember from titrations and practice of titrations, you've got to add it drop by drop. Um, and I did mention this as well in one of the videos where we look at acid base uh, equilibria so um, have a look at that video where we, we talk about um, a little bit more about um, a titration technique but you've got to add it drop by drop because one drop makes a big difference as you can see from some of the graphs in that video that I did on um, acid base equilibria so what we've got to be careful is we get a sharp color change. So manganate ions from aqueous potassium permanganate solution are purple. Okay, so it's a really lovely color. It's really nice. And so what they'll do is they'll immediately react with the reducing agent until all that reducing agent is um, is up. So our reducing agent in this case is our iron 2 plus in a conical flask. So as soon as the manganate hits and and comes into contact with an Fe2 plus, it reacts with it straight away. Um, and it will keep on doing that until there's no more Fe2 plus ions left. So one drop at the end point, like I say, can turn the solution purple, which is the color of your oxidizing agent that um, obviously that you're adding. Um, and you could use a colorless oxidizing agent and a color reducing agent. So what we're looking for there is a color disappearing instead of a color appearing. So you see you can adapt this to, to, to various different um, scenarios. And then what we do is we read how much oxidizing agent was added. Uh, and we always read the bottom of the meniscus and we always read it at eye level. Okay, so the meniscus, remember, is that semicircle um, like water tension or the, the tension that you get on the surface of, of the liquid. Uh, and you always read at the bottom of that, not at the top. And so we always record our results um, to two decimal places uh, and repeat results until we get two concordant results. So that must mean that the results must be within 0 0.10 centimeters cubed of each other. So what we don't want is getting results of 20, 25, 21, um, you know, centimeters cubed. Um, they're all over the place. How do you know which one's right? So you've got to keep going until you've actually um, hit one that is uh, that is concordant. Okay, so let's look at how we can actually um, use this in practice. Um, so redox titrations can be used to work out the concentration of a reagent. And this is what we're going to be looking at here. So here is an example. We're going to have 18.3 centimeters cubed of 0 0.0250 moles per dm cubed of potassium manganate. And these react with 25 centimeters cubed of acidified iron 2 sulfate solution. So that's going to produce our iron 2 plus ions. So what we need to do is calculate the concentration of Fe2 plus ions in the solution. So we're using the same um, example that we used in the previous slide. We're going to actually put some numbers into it. So the first thing we need to do is write out our equation first. So this is our overall equation of manganate ions reacting with our H plus. This is our acid here. This is why it's got to be acidified um, with iron 2 plus here. Um, so we've added the acid in here. Uh, Mn2 plus, Fe3 plus, and 4H2O. Now we're putting our manganate and our burette here, so this is our purple solution, and then we're putting our acidified iron sulfate uh, in the conical flask that's here. Okay, so we're adding everything uh, everything into 
uh, into our setup there, as you can see. So then what we need to do is we need to calculate the number of moles of manganate iron. So this is the number of moles in here. And again, if you've watched some of my videos, I always use the saying, if in doubt, work out the moles, because the moles is, is quite a universal um, um, uh, unit in, uh, in chemistry, and it, it's adapted and used in many different equations. So if in doubt, work out the moles. So this is what we're going to do. So we're working out the moles. So it's concentration times volume. Um, and we've got concentration of 0 0.250 because that's the concentration there. Um, and the volume, we needed 18.3 centimetres cubed of that. Now, you'll notice here what I'll do again, if you've seen my videos, um, is I normally just put times 10 to the minus 3 on the end. And um, this converts it from centimetres cubed to decimetres cubed because it must be in the same. It's exactly the same as dividing by 1,000. If you'd like to do that, that's absolutely fine. Um, I just put it on the end there because it just keeps it easier. Okay, so if you're wondering where, the, where did that come from. Right, so use the equation to find out the molar ratio in order to work out the number of moles of Fe2. So we here, here we see we've got a one, 5 ratio, so we've got a ratio between manganate and iron 2 plus. So um, number of moles of Fe2 plus is 4.58 times 10 to the minus 4, because that's what we've just worked out there. Multiply that by 5, because we've got a 5 to 1 ratio. So we've got five, as, 5 times as many Fe2 plus ions as we have manganate. So therefore, the number of moles of iron is 2.29 times by 10 to the minus 3. And the final thing that we need to do is just calculate the concentration. So the concentration is moles divided by volume. So remember this from year one chemistry or any different mole calculations. So we get a concentration of 0 0.092 moles per decimeters cubed. Okay. So fairly straightforward. Very similar to what you've seen already with acid-base titrations. So, um, except when we're not using, obviously, an acid and a base, but the principle is the same. So, what we're, as, as you'll see later, there's going to be some more complicated titrations. Um, but, you know, you need to get your head around the basic stuff here first. Um, and, you know, and then we'll look at some of the more um, complex ones. Okay, so this is where it gets a little bit more complicated, but it's a nice experiment, to be fair. So redox titrations can be used to work out the percentage of iron in iron tablets. So this is like these supplements that you take, you know, if you take iron supplements or multivitamins. So actually what we can do is work out um, the uh, percentage in, in iron tablets. So here we've got, you might have done this practical if, you, if you're in um, school or college um, and you've got access to a lab, then you might have done this one. But I'm going to give you the figures, obviously, because you can't do a practical here. So calculate the percentage of iron in a tablet with a mass of two and a half grams, which was dissolved in dilute sulfuric acid to give a 250 centimeters cubed solution. So we've put it into a big, big flask, okay? A 25 centimeters portion of that solution was then reacted with two and a half centimeters cubed of 0.025 moles potassium manganate solution. Okay, so there's a lot of information there, but what we're gonna try and do is break it down as much as I can, okay? And hopefully, what I'm going to try and do is paint a picture of what's happening here because obviously it's very difficult to um, to show you exactly what's happening on, on video form. So I hope you've got a good imagination. Okay, so the step one, what we need to do is write out an equation and balance it. So there's our equation. So we've got manganate reacting with H+, plus, form, uh, reacting with our 5Fe2+, plus, Mn2+, plus, Fe3+, plus, and water. So this is the same as the reaction that we've um, that we've seen before. Okay, so number two, step two, is we need to calculate the number of moles of manganate. So no difference, okay? So here we go. So moles, concentration, volume. Um, so we've got the concentration of being given that, which is, um, uh, where was it there? 0 0.0250 moles per decimeters cubed. Um, and we've got a volume because we told that um, 12 and a half centimeters cubed is required. We multiply that by 10 to the minus three to convert into decimeters cubed. So don't forget to do that. Um, and so therefore we've got the number of moles of manganate is 3.125 times by 10 to the minus 4. Fine. Okay, so then we now need to use the equation to find out the molar ratio in order to work out the number of moles of Fe2+. plus. No difference. Okay, so exactly the same as what we've been, been doing before. So there's a 1 to 5 molar ratio here. Um, so we need to multiply the number of moles of manganate by five and that will tell us the number of moles of fe2 plus that's in our 25 centimeter cubed solution okay that's very very important so this is obviously the number of moles here is number of fe2 plus is in 25 centimeters cubed so this is where i want you to imagine it you've got a titration it's got manganate in it you've got a conical flask below 
it's got your iron solution in there, your iron 2 plus. That's your sample that you've made. But you've got 25 centimeters cubed in there. Okay, you've just got a small sample in that in that little conical flask. Okay. The problem is, look back at the question. We made this solution. We took an iron tablet, two and a half grams of it, we've crushed it up, and we've dissolved it in a massive vat of um uh, of, of solution so we've got 250 centimeter cubed flask massive and out of that flask we took a small sample of it okay so it's a bit like um it's a bit like uh, here's an example it's a bit like having um, a jug and you've made orange juice in that jug you've made a massive jug of orange juice okay and um, you put ice in it and it's nice and it's like summery and um, you know really nice and then what you're doing is you're pouring some of that juice in the jug into a small cup and then you're drinking it that's exactly what we've done here we've made a big solution big um, flask of the solution and we've taken a small sample of that solution and put it into this conical flask okay that's important because this is going to help to explain the maths bit from now on okay so the fourth step is we now need to calculate the number of moles of fe2 plus iron in the whole iron tablet by working out how many moles there are in that original 250 centimeter cubed flask. So that's like the jug that we've made, okay? So we know you've made your orange juice, you add, let's say you add, um, uh, you know, you add um, 30 mils of orange juice and then you add um, 480, uh, 470 mils of water. So that's 500 mils in total of orange juice. You're, when you're drinking it in a cup, you're not getting 30 mils of orange juice. You're getting a portion of that. You're getting a fraction of that, depending on what you've taken. Okay, you don't have the same amount of orange juice in your cup as what was made in the original flask, do you? You're only getting some of it. So it's exactly the same here. We've only got some of the Fe2 plus ions in our conical flask. Okay, all the Fe2 plus ions that were originally in that big flask, we don't have all of them in our little flask because we've only taken a portion of it. So what we need to do is work out, right, well, we know how many iron, iron 2 pluses we've got in our sample, but how many do we have in that big flask? So this, is where we're this is what we're going to work out here. Okay, so the moles of Fe2 plus in 250 centimeters cubed is, um, is 1... Uh, 1.5625 times 10 to the minus 3. That's what we've worked out here. It's the amount of Fe2 plus and 25. Very easy. We multiply it by 10. Because if we do 25 times 10, that gives us 250. So we do exactly the same with the moles of Fe2 plus. So that tells us we have this many moles in our 250 centimeter cube flask that we've just worked out. Okay. So you following? So now we're up to that big flask stage. Okay. So now what we need to do is calculate the mass of fe in the tablet okay so remember that was the tablet that we used so the mass is moles times by the relative atomic mass so the mass of the iron in the iron tablets so one mole of iron raise weighs 55.8 grams so one tablet contains so this is um, 1.5625 times 10 to the minus 3 this is the number of moles of um uh Yes, this is the number of moles of Fe2+, plus. multiply it by 55.8, so that tells us that we've actually got 0 0.871 grams of Fe in our tablet. Okay, so remember that's one mole of iron weighs that amount, so one tablet contains that amount. Okay, so it's moles times by the relative atomic mass, that's the total amount in that, in that tablet there. Okay, okay, so this should be, now calculate the percentage of iron in the iron tablet. So this should be minus two actually. I apologize for that because this is actually coming from your, your flask here. So then we then calculate the percentage of iron in the tablet. So the mass of the tablet is 2.5 grams. So we should get 3.48%, uh, okay? So this is how you work out your redox, uh, your redox titration, working out the percentage uh, of iron in iron tablets. Okay, so Let's have a look at another type of titration. So this is an iodine sodium thiosulfate titration. Okay, so this is a funny one. And actually I've done videos on this um, as well for the um, iodine sodium thiosulfate titration um, with a little bit more detail in the whiteboard video. So if you click on the link, that will just pop up there uh, on the screen and you'll be able to um, have a look at that video there if you, if you ever get a bit stuck. So we're just gonna go through it here 
uh, on the screen, but I did go through it in, in quite a bit of detail as well on the whiteboard. So this titration is useful for finding out the concentration of an oxidizing agent. Okay, so this titration involves three steps. Okay, so use the oxidizing agent KiO3 to oxidize iodide ions to iodine. So that's step one. Step two is we then carry out a titration to work out the moles of iodine produced in step one. And then the third step is we use the moles of iodine in step two to work out the concentration of IO3 minus. So there's three steps here. So what I'm going to do is break it down into them three separate steps. Okay, so the first thing, step one, is we're going to measure the volume of KiO3, that's our potassium iodate 5 uh, oxidizing agent. And what this will do is this will produce the IO3 minus iron needed and usually... Um, you would use 25 centimeters cube, but it could be any volume. So what we're going to do here is we're going to uh, measure our iodide, our potassium iodate uh, solution, and that's going to produce the IO3 minus iron needed. So then what we're going to do is add excess acidified potassium iodide solution, so Ki, to the KiO3 solution. Um, that obviously that we're weighing out, and so this is our reaction here. So we can see here we've got our IO3 minus plus our 5i minus, plus 6h plus, will form three lots of H2O and three iodine, so three I2. So basically what we're saying here is the iodide ions, so the I minus ions are oxidized to I2. So we're going from I minus to I2. And so the more concentrated the oxidizing agent, okay, the more I minus ions are oxidized. This is going to be quite important. We'll come back to this as well when we, when we come back. We we'll come back to that. So this is remember what we're finding out is the concentration of an oxidizing agent. Okay. So this is step one. So we've produced our iodine here. So used our oxidizing agent, which is this bit. Okay. So we've used that to produce our iodine. Okay. So that's that's the first step. Okay. So I've just put the steps up at the top because we're now going to look at we're now going to look at step two, which is the actual method. So we've got our iodine that we've produced. Okay, so then what we're going to do is add that solution from step one into the conical flask. So that's the solution with our iodine in there. And we're going to put that into the conical flask, as you can see there. We're then going to add sodium thiosulfate, which is Na2S2O3, into the conical flask. And we're going to look out for a pale yellow color. Okay. Then as that color change is difficult to see, because we're going to add that and we're going to look at this pale yellow color, what we normally do is we add starch. We just add a couple of centimeters cubed of starch in there, and that turns deep blue if iodine is still present in the flask. And what we want to do is just keep adding until that blue color disappears. Okay, So when the blue color disappears, it means that we have no more iodine left in there. And remember, the iodine has been produced from our oxidizing agent which is KiO3 so the amount of iodine in there is basically dependent on how much of this we had originally so this is where it's actually working out so at this point all of the iodine is reacted and we can use the volume of sodium thiosulfate um, added to work out the number of moles of iodine okay and obviously if we know that we can then work out how much oxidizing agent we've got okay so let's have a look at the calculation so, for example, all of the iodine reacted with 10.5 centimeters cubed of 0 0.140 moles per dm cubed of thiosulfate solution. Okay, so these are the numbers that we've got. So here's our reaction. So the iodine that was present in that flask here is reacting with the sodium thiosulfate, which is here. And that's obviously producing our iodide ions, which are colorless. And obviously the starch, um, the starch present in there, the starch will only go like a deep blue black color if these are present if all of these are used up then obviously the starch will not show that color okay so the equation shows what's happening in the titration so iodine reacting with the thiosulfate solution so let's have a look we need to work out the moles of thiosulfate first so that's concentration times by volume and you need to divide that by a thousand to remember to to get it into decimeters cubed so Moles of thiosulfate is 0 0.140, because that's the concentration, times by, okay, it's so going to multiply it by the volume, which is 10.5 centimeters cubed, divide that by 1,000, and that gives you 1.47 times by 10 to the minus 3 uh, moles of thiosulfate in the, in the burette. OK, 
Okay, so the moles of thiosulfate uh, react in a 2 to 1 ratio with your iodine. So one mole of iodine, which is here, reacts with two moles of thiosulfate. So um, this is quite important because it means that we can now work out the moles of iodine. So the moles of iodine is um, 1.47 divided by 2, because it's a 2 to 1 ratio, uh, and that gets us 7.35 times, times by 10 to the minus 4 moles. Okay, so now we know the number of moles of iodine, and remember the number of moles of iodine equates to how much of the oxidizing agent that we are used to produce them in the first place. Okay, so let's look at the last step. This is step three, is we're going to use the moles of iodine in step two to work out the concentration of IO3 minus ions that was used to produce them in the first place. So remember, uh, the moles of iodine, just a reminder, the moles of iodine was 7.35 times by 10 to the minus 4. And remember, we used 25 centimeters cubed of our oxidizing agent, which is KIO3. So here's the equation from step one. This is our oxidizing agent, remember, producing our iodine. So, um, so in step three, we basically look back at our original equation and we'll use this to work out the number of moles of IO3 and then hence the concentration. So you can see there's a lot of steps involved in this one. So we have three moles of iodine are produced from one mole of IO3 minus. So we have a three to one ratio. So what that means is the number of moles of IO3 minus um, is effectively the number of moles of iodine divided by three. So that's going to give us 2.45 times by 10 to the minus 4 moles of IO3 was actually present. And then now we've got the moles, we can then work out, obviously, the concentration. So the concentration of your IO3 minus is moles divided by volume. Um, remember, the volume must be in decimeters cubed, so we need to convert that 25 centimeters cubed into decimeters cubed by dividing by 1,000. Uh, and we get the um, total concentration to be 9.8 times by 10 to the minus 3 moles per dm cubed. So effectively what we're doing here is we're, we're measuring the, um, uh, the concentration of IO3 indirectly, as you can see here. So we're doing it in three steps. <coughs> okay. So let's look at another type of titration. This is the, 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 final, the final titration you'd be pleased to hear, is the copper percentage titration, okay? So this uses iodide ions as seen before, okay? So exactly the same, but the copper two ions oxidize iodide ions to iodine, okay? And this is particularly useful as it allows us to find the percentage of copper in an alloy such as brass, for example. So step one, what we're going to do is use an oxidizing agent to oxidize as much of the iodide as possible. Okay, so we do this by dissolving a known mass of the alloy in some concentrated nitric acid, and we pour that into a 25, 250 centimeter cube conical flask and make up to 250 centimeters cubed with deionized water. So what we're doing is dissolving the metal using a concentrated acid. So we get a solution. So then what we're going to do is pipette 25 centimeters cubed of that solution into a conical flask. So remember this this jug, uh, jug uh, glass uh, analogy. So we're going to add sodium carbonate solution to neutralize that residual nitric acid because remember it's very, very concentrated. And we keep adding until we just start to see a precipitate form. Okay. Then what we do is we add several drops of ethanoic acid to remove that precipitate. Okay, so that's why we're adding that to neutralize the acid there. And then um, we add excess acidified potassium iodate, uh, iodide solution, and that will react with the copper ions. Okay, so remember that the uh, potassium iodide is our source of iodide ions. So our reaction here, um, our um, simplified reaction here is copper 2 plus from our, so, um, our ionic equation, so to say. So copper 2 plus reacts with our iodide ions, which has come from our potassium iodide, and that will form copper iodide and iodine solution, okay? So the I minus ions are oxidized to I2. The copper 2 plus ions um, are reduced to copper 1 here, and a white precipitate of copper iodide is formed. So that's the white precipitate that, that we're starting to see, that we're starting to see there. Okay, so... The next step we need to do is we need to work out the number of moles of iodine that has been produced from that reaction that we've just seen there. So what we're going to do is take the product mixture of step one and we're going to titrate that against sodium thiosulfate solution. So similar to the other reaction that we've seen, and we're going to find the number of moles of iodine present. 
Okay, so once we've done that, um, you know, we're doing the same method as we've done before. We then need to calculate the concentration of the oxidizing agent that's in um, that was in our reaction. So the first thing we need to do is work out the number of moles of copper in both the 25 centimeters cubed and 250 centimeters cubed solution. So remember that you need to take into account that ratio of a 10 to 1. Um, so you've got to uh, multiply by 10. So you work out the number of moles in here, then work out, multiply it by 10 to work out the number of moles in the original solution that we made. Remember, we made a big a big um, uh, container of that. So we take into account the um, two moles of copper to one moles of iodine um, reaction as well. So make sure you take into account that. And so now we know the concentration in the 250 centimeters cubed. We can then calculate, calculate the mass of copper in the original alloy. Okay. Um, and so the last step is then calculate the percentage of copper in the alloy. So just like we've done there, but obviously there's a slight error in that in that first slide where we use the moles in the 25 centimeters cubed. You must be using the moles in the full flask. Um, that's that's very important because what's the point in calculating the number of moles in the full flask? So that's what we're doing there. Okay, so it's just the same method. So I haven't gone through the detailed method for this one because we've seen it already in the previous steps. Okay. So let's just look. Um, this is the final, the final part of the of the video. Is just looking at the errors in these titrations. So what we're going to be looking for is um, the starch indicator um, is added at the correct point when most of the iodine has actually reacted. So normally we'll just start to see a pale yellow colour, then you add your um, your starch to it. Um, if this didn't happen, then what we'd see is that blue colour would take. Uh, a long time to disappear so we must titrate it first until we just start to see a bit of a yellow color starting to appear and then we add our starch in there so not we don't add, add it right at the start and um, make sure that the starch solution um, is only used um, make sure the starch solution uh, or make the starch solution only when we're actually ready to use it and um, we don't want to make it prematurely it must be a fresh a fresh sample um, the copper iodide so um, that we're using there, precipitate, that makes it difficult to see the colour of the solution. So that could uh, form an error as well. So we've got to uh, make sure we take that into account. Um, and finally, um, we've got to keep the solution as cool as possible because the iodine produced in the reaction can evaporate readily at room temperature. And obviously that will give you uh, a false result because it, it'll tell you that you've got less iodine than, than actually what you did produce originally. Um, so um, obviously we don't want uh, we don't want that to happen um, at all. Okay, so that's it. So that's the end of um, topic fourteen, redox two. There's a lot of stuff in there, as you can see, a lot of titration, a lot of calculation. Just make sure you um, you know you practice it regularly. Like I say, there's a full range of videos on there for Edexcel. Um, have a good look there. They're all for free. Please just hit the subscribe button. That's all I ask. That'll be fantastic. Just to show your support. They are available to purchase as well if you want your own copy. Really good value. Click on the link in the description box. But um, that's it. I'm off to get a cup of tea. Bye-bye.